Well, it's good to be with you here this evening. Uh, it warms my heart to see all you young people out here on a Thursday night in a praise and worship service. Uh, it makes me feel good about the future of the church. So, uh, <laughs> again, uh, thank God for this ministry. Well, tonight we're going to be in John chapter 11. And this is a, a real familiar Bible story for probably most of you. And, uh, and I think it's kind of like the story of Adam and Eve um, Noah's Ark, Jonah and the fish, in that I think a lot of unbelievers, people who are not of faith, are for at least familiar with the story. They may not know all the details, but they've heard of the characters. So tonight we're going to be talking about Lazarus and being uh, raised from the dead. And um, just as an introduction to uh, uh, chapter 11, a lot of people consider um, Lazarus being raised from the dead to be the uh, centerpiece or the climax of John's gospel. And it's odd that uh, for being uh, uh, the centerpiece of this gospel, this story is not even mentioned in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. And another interesting part, part about this is that at the end of chapter 11, you find out that it's this one single event, the raising of Lazarus, that... Uh, takes the Sanhedrin past their tipping point, and from this point on, there's a death warrant out on Jesus' life. And in about two months from this time, uh, Jesus is on the cross, and then three days after that, we know that uh, he more or less trades places with Lazarus. So chapter 11 begins where 10 leaves off. Jesus and his disciples are in Perea, and this is a region east of the Jordan River, and it's the area where John the Baptist uh, did a lot of his baptizing, where he had his ministry. And if you remember last week uh, in chapter 10, uh, Stuart was telling us, well, Jesus was at the uh, Feast of Dedication, and as Stuart put it, uh, put on your yarmulke, here comes Hanukkah, so much funica, remember that? Well, for Jesus, it wasn't so much funny because he almost got stoned. Uh, he had made the statement that him and the Father were one, and the crowd really didn't go for that. So they tried to stone him. And so it's at that point that him and the disciples, they escaped, and they went to Perea. Well, while they're in Perea, Mary and Martha get a word out to them that uh, their brother Lazarus is deathly ill. And Jesus and Lazarus have a real close relationship. You know, as in verse 3, it talks about uh, uh, the messenger say, Lord, the one you love is sick. You know, kind of representing that relationship he had with Lazarus. But at this point, uh, Jesus, he doesn't pack up his stuff and, and go to Bethany. Uh, instead, he kind of hangs around Perea for, for a couple more days. And uh, the reason for that is he wants to make sure that Lazarus is good and dead, if there is such a thing, by the time he gets there. Now, he tells everybody in, in verse 3 that uh, this illness won't result in the death of Lazarus, but uh, uh, again, uh, he just kind of leaves it hanging at that. And so, uh, but he goes on to say that this whole situation, the purpose of Lazarus getting sick, is to demonstrate, in verse 4, God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Okay, so kind of leave. We have a break in the, in the scene here. Two days later, out of nowhere, Jesus is there with his disciples, and he says, uh, let's go back to Judea. doesn't say why. He just says, let's go. Now, the disciples are a little hesitant here because... Uh, they just came from there, and they almost got killed there, and they're in no hurry to go back. So they're kind of hesitant, kind of thinking, you know, what, what's this all about? And it's at that point there, uh, Jesus gives us uh, what he says in verse 12. He, or, yeah, he talks about the 12 hours of daylight. And it's kind of cryptic, but I think what Jesus is saying here is that... Um, you know, his time has not yet come. It's still safe for them to go to Bethany, which is just outside of Jerusalem, um, because, you know, uh, they'll be safe. No harm will come to them. So, um, uh, you know, he says, let's go. 
And so the disciples are kind of hee-hawing around here, not really wanting to go. And then uh, Jesus more or less tells them, hey, look, Lazarus has died. Now, remember earlier he said Lazarus, you know, sickness won't end in death. But here he tells them that Lazarus is dead. And Jesus, we don't know how we know he died, you know, other than, you know, he's the son of God. So we just figure he knows everything. So anyway, um, he tells them, uh, uh, you know, there's a purpose for it. And he says, again, uh, the purpose for this is that so the disciples and us today as readers of this, uh, of this gospel will have a stronger faith. And, and here's the deal. If Jesus would have just went immediately after Lazarus died and raised him from the dead, uh, Jesus would get the praise and the honor. Uh, but now, raising him from the dead after a long period of time, um, you know, they, they'll know that God was a part of this miracle and God had a lot to do with it. Um, you know, and it's true that, you know, Jesus had raised other people from the dead. You know, there was Jairus' daughter and there was the widow of Nain's son, but they were raised from the dead the same day that they died. You know, this one's going to be a little bit longer. See, Jewish tradition had it that when a person dies, the soul kind of hangs around the body for up to three days, but by the fourth day, the spirit's gone. And so uh, if, if you've been dead for four days, there's no helping you. So that's kind of the premise that, that uh, uh, Jesus is going on here. So in verse 16, Thomas is kind of putting all this together. Okay, they're going to go to Bethany. All right, first, Judea, Bethany area, is a dangerous place for these guys. Second, Lazarus is dead. He lives in Bethany. It's only a mile and a half from Jerusalem. Uh, that'd be like if we started walking from here. By the time we got the price chopper, that's about a mile and a half. You can do that in a half hour, 45 minutes at the most. Um, and the third thing is, is that Thomas sees that Jesus is committed to going, okay? So um, while the other disciples are still wavering on this, uh, Thomas speaks up and he confronts the other disciples and he says, let's also go that we may die with him. And so Thomas is not willing to allow Jesus to face death by himself. And so uh, I think this is a really good example of what true faith is all about. Um, if, you, if you truly love the Lord, you should be willing to take risks for him. And if you go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, and hopefully it'll come up behind us, it says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, I've heard that uh, verse misused quite a few times. Uh, one time, a fellow I know, his uh, wife died, and we were talking about it, and he said, well, that's a cross I have to bear. And I had another fellow once tell me, you know, it's a cross I have to bear when he found out he had cancer. Well, to me, they misused this verse because, to me, to take up your cross is a voluntary thing. If you're faced with a burden that you don't want, that's not really taking up a cross. That's a burden you got to bear. But if you're doing something voluntarily, if you're taking risk, you know, this, this is what uh, Jesus is talking about here. So anyway, uh, Thomas convinces the other ones, and off they go. They go to, uh, off to Bethany. Now, as soon as Jesus gets to Bethany, the scene's uh, described to us pretty quickly what's going on. Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. Again, perfect timing. With the soul's gone, you know, he's good and dead right now. And uh, there's mourning. The, the, the period of mourning is in full swing. And uh, so there's a lot of commotion, a lot of things going on. And when Jesus gets there, the first one he runs into is Martha. And she comes out to meet him. And the first thing she says in verse 21 is, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And so here it doesn't sound like Martha's blaming Jesus for Lazarus' death, um, but you can kind of see the disappointment in her, in her voice, you know, um, because when she needed him, Jesus wasn't there, because I'm sure the messenger she sent had been back for two days already before Jesus arrived. But where's Jesus? You know, what's this all about, uh, you know, uh, asking it'll be given unto you? You know, at this, this was not the, 
what happened here on her case. But anyway, she keeps talking, and uh, verse 22, it says, but I know, she says, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And it kind of sounds like here she's prodding Jesus to raise Lazarus from the dead. But I don't think that's the case because in verse 39, when uh, Jesus tells her to roll back the stone, she hesitates. She doesn't want to do it. So I don't think she's uh, uh, telling Jesus or asking Jesus, prodding him to, uh, to raise Lazarus at this. I think what she's uh, uh, saying here is something like, even though you didn't get here in time to save Lazarus, I think you can still perform miracles. You can still heal people. You're still able to do these things. And so at that point, the conversation kind of shifts, and it's kind of reminiscent of when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. It kind of seems like they were talking past each other. Well, Jesus, he, uh, uh, he says, your brother will live again. And Martha says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And then Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. So I'm going to stop right here. This is the fifth I am statement in John that Jesus gives. Uh, and usually when he gives an I am statement, it's uh, a precursor to a miracle. Okay, uh, Remember when he fed the 5,000 with the, with the bread and the fish? He's, that's when he said, I am the bread of life. When he healed the blind man that was born blind, that's when he said, I am the light of the world. Last week, Stuart talked about, uh, I am the sheep's gate and I am the good shepherd. Well, tonight, it's, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. And he goes on to say, he who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives believes in me will never die. And then he asked Martha, do you believe this? And I think she's kind of doing, what? You know? Uh, what did you just say? Uh, I didn't quite catch that. And you can kind of tell that from her response because um, she doesn't answer his question, but she, asks, she answers a basic question that I, I think that came to her. It's, it's more or less what she answered was, do you believe in me? And then that's when Martha gives her good confession of faith. She says, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And this is the kind of answer that Jesus was looking for. Um, he promised victory over death for those who have faith and believe in him, and she professes that faith. Now, if you want to see what victory over death looks like in 2018, just look to your left and look to your right. All you people out here whose lives have been changed through Christ, that's victory over death today, okay? So... Even though what Jesus was saying to her uh, probably wasn't clear to her, uh, she could trust what he said because she knows who he was, who sent him, and where he came from. And if you go to the end of John, uh, chapter 20, verse 31, it says, and this is John writing, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's why John wrote this book, the, the Gospel of John. It's to increase people's faith. And from Martha's response, um, you know, she kind of underscores the purpose of the book. She talks about she believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And that's what we're all, we're all um, uh, our faith is all about. So the scene ends here, another abrupt break. And Mary goes and gets, or Martha goes and gets Mary. Now, um, up to this point, Mary was unaware that Jesus was even there. And so she rushes out to, to, to meet him. Um, and when she gets there, her very first words are the same as Martha's. It's, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now, because her and Martha both say the same thing the first time they see Jesus, it makes you think that they probably discussed this thing several times in the last four days, okay? And so they hit him up. Now, Mary and uh, her friends, they're weeping bitterly, you know, because of the loss. And uh, this here scene, this affects Jesus quite a bit. And it says his emotions were stirred. And you have to think that they were stirred almost to the breaking point. Because in verse 33, it says, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Jesus was troubled. You know, you don't hear that very often. 
Uh, I think at Gethsemane, when he was sweating the blood, it said he was troubled. So, you know, this is affecting him quite a bit. So it says here that Jesus began to weep. Shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Now, the mourners, they're all wailing and carrying on, weeping bitterly. I don't see Jesus doing that. I think he's, he starts crying, but it's almost to himself. And I can see some tears, you know, in my vision of what's going on. You see tears kind of running down his cheek. But I don't think he was, he was crying for Lazarus because he knows how the story's going to end. I think he was crying because he understood the power of death and the power it has over each and every one of us. Um, it's because of Satan that uh, God's creation has been ravaged throughout history. And I think that's what he was crying about. He was crying about our death, everybody in humanity. So anyway, um, going back to the purpose of John's gospel, it's to bring the reader to faith. Now, this book has a lot of contrast in it between believers and unbelievers. Um, but the, words out of, the first words out of Mary and Martha's mouths um, was that Jesus, if you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't die. And I think these two gals were working under two assumptions. One, Jesus had to be present in order to save Lazarus. And the second one, now that it's been four days, there's nothing Jesus can do. And this is the, the same flawed assumptions that the uh, royal official in chapter 4 had. Remember, his son was sick, and he, um, uh, he went to Jesus to um, uh, heal his son. And in John chapter 4, verse 48, this is where Jesus told him, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. In other words, he was upset at people that had to see a miracle before they would believe. And even a lot of them saw miracles and they still didn't believe. And so um, uh, he was telling that official and, and everybody else that was hearing it that uh, seeing miracles with, one, with one's own eyes was never enough for Jesus. Because when you see something, it's no longer faith, it's sight. You no longer believe, but you know, okay? And that was never good enough for Jesus. What he was looking for was followers that would accept his word without hesitation and uh, uh, his word, his testimony, and without having to see a miracle first. And, and to him, this was the greatest type of love. And a couple of examples. Back in Luke chapter 7, verses 2 through 10, the story about the centurion. Okay, there was a centurion who was a friend of the elders of the synagogue, okay? And uh, as a matter of fact, he helped these, uh, the, these leaders rebuild their synagogue. Well, the centurion's servant got deathly ill. So he asked, he had heard of Jesus before, so he asked the, uh, the, the elders to go ask Jesus to heal his uh, servant. So they went and they begged Jesus to come heal his servant. And so Jesus agrees. And so he's on his way to the centurion's house. And... Before he gets there, the centurion sends more messengers out to intercept him. And the messengers tell Jesus, just say the word, and I know my servant will be healed. You don't have to come to my house. And matter of fact, he goes on to say, I am not worthy to even have you in my house. And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at the man's faith. And in Luke 7, verse 9, and he's talking about the centurion, he says, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. So here Jesus is praising a centurion when a lot of times of, you know, the, the people of Israel uh, didn't have the faith he was looking for. Another good, well, another example, not a good example, is back to Thomas in chapter 20. Remember after Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to the ten disciples in the locked room. Uh, Judas wasn't there and Thomas wasn't there. Okay. And so Jesus appears, and then later on, uh, the disciples tell Thomas that they saw the resurrected Jesus. And remember what Thomas he says? He says, I don't believe that. He said, unless I put my fingers in his hands, my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe. Well, the next time they're in the locked room, uh, Jesus appears again. Thomas is with them, and 
uh, Jesus points him out. He says, okay, Thomas, come here. Here I am. You know, put your fingers wherever you need to. But then uh, he says um, in verse 29 of John 20, he says, stop doubting and believe. And then Jesus went on to say, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Okay, so again, the thing about the miracles, he's looking for people who will believe in him without the miracles, okay? And he kind of reprimands uh, Thomas. Again, stop doubting and believe. He's speaking to all of us here. Okay, let's go back to Mary and Martha. They go to the tomb, and this is where Jesus tells them to take the stone away. And, but he doesn't say why. You know, they're probably thinking, well, he just wants to go in there and see Lazarus one more time. Uh, now, the body's been in there four days. It's probably decomposing. It's decaying. Um, but we know that Jesus has given Martha a chance to see the glory of God. Remember back to verse 4, why are we doing this? So that God will get the glory. Um, but before she can see this glory, it's going to depend on her faith. Here we go. We're going back to the faith thing again. And it's a whether or not her faith will allow her to overcome her fears and her traditions, okay? Um, so everything in Martha's mind is telling her to keep the tomb shut because disturb, disturbing a grave is a big taboo. She reminds Jesus that the corpse has been in there four days and it's decomposing. And I like the way the old King James Version puts verse 39. King James says, Lord, by this time he stinketh, Okay? And so, um, here's a good example of Martha. She's asking Jesus to do something, but in the process of, of doing it, there's going to be a mess, okay? There's going to be a bad odor come out of there. And she's not real sure that she wants any part of it, that she wants to uh, uh, go through the process. And it's kind of like sometimes when we pray, I know I've prayed for patience before, and I've found myself on one of these two-lane highways, hilly, curvy, and I'm behind a tractor going 15 miles an hour. And I get mad, road rage, you know. It, you know, it's <laughs> watching college football and uh, driving. If I had to give up things that make me the maddest, it would be those two things, okay? <laughs> so, uh, but again, sometimes we pray for things, but we don't want to go through the process that it takes to, to resolve that. So... But ultimately, Martha's faith overcomes her fears, and she allows the tomb to be opened. Now, Jesus prepares to do this miracle uh, by first praying. And one of the things he says in here is that, Father, I know you hear me. I know you always hear me. And that's the way we need to be when we pray. We need to know that we're being heard. And so at that point, Jesus calls out his name, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes out. He comes forth from the tomb. Now, um, again, Jesus is validating his I am statement um, because, you know, he validated the claim to be the resurrection and the life. And the point of that day was uh, for Jesus to show that he was the Lord and had authority over death and that through him that we have a new life. Now, the story kind of ends right here, really. And it, it's... Um, it's kind of curious because you figure Lazarus comes out of the tomb, you know, there'd be say, hey, whoa, what was it like being dead? You know, uh, uh, did you go to heaven? What's heaven like? You know, we'd kind of like to know these things. It's not in there. There's no back slapping, no, no gratitude shown by the Martha and Mary to Jesus. Instead, the focus now goes to the, the people that saw the miracle. And it said that uh, many believed because of that. They understood the purpose of the miracle and many of them, uh, uh, you know, turn to faith because of that. So as that story ends, uh, there's a lot of different characters uh, and a lot of situations. And I find myself, I can relate to a lot of them. Um, you know, it's like when Mary and Martha asked Jesus for help. Uh, nothing happened for a few days. And so they weren't sure that they were being heard. Remember what Jesus prayed in his prayer. He said, Father, I know you always hear me. That's the way we need to be. I mean, sometimes we pray for things, and things don't happen as quick as we would like them. 
Sometimes the answer ain't exactly what we were looking for. And then, you know, again, sometimes Jesus says no to us. I mean, uh, you got to, his will be done, right? So we accept that if he says no to us, there's a reason for it. You know, it's not the best thing for us. Um, Martha, uh, another situation with her. Uh, She heard the words of, of Jesus but she was confused by him. There's times I read the Bible and I don't quite understand what I'm reading, um, but I, I still trust what I read because I know who said it and I know where he came from and you know, I know why he came. So uh, sometimes we just need to keep the faith. When we're reading the Bible, we may not understand the whole thing, uh, but we just need to keep the faith and keep walking with Jesus and eventually he'll bring us to a place where we can see these things clear. Um, maybe we're like Martha. We talked about this. Uh, we pray for something, but we, won't, we don't want to go through the process of, uh, of uh, resolving the issue. You know, uh, I've prayed for wisdom before. Then all of a sudden, I find myself having to make all these hard decisions. And it's like, well, oh, you know, I asked for it. Here it comes. Okay. So if we pray for something, be sincere about it. Be, be ready for anything. Okay. God answers our prayers in ways sometimes we don't expect. Sometimes we're like Lazarus. You know, we, we feel like life has passed us by. Um, we, we feel like the life has gone out of us. We feel bound up where we can't move. I remember what it was like to be a senior in college. I didn't have a job. I had a young family. Uh, I didn't have a job, you know. And it's like, that's kind of paralyzing, you know. So just keep the faith, you know. Um, God uses moments like that to uh, refine us. So whenever you're going through a problem, ah, don't give up, man. Just remember, God's there with you. He's walking through it with you. Okay, maybe you're like Thomas. I've been like him before. Sometimes I'm on fire for the Lord. You know, I'm speaking boldly. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And then there's other times I'm like, okay, my faith ain't quite as strong. You know, and I kind of shy away from situations that, you know, I know I ought to handle uh, maybe I feel like I got that little voice saying, hey, you need to give this guy a testimony, but I'm a little afraid to do it, you know. So um, all these different situations, I can see myself throughout this chapter of the book. But there is one last thought I'd like to leave you with, and that is, okay, uh, I go to a Christian church down in Newburgh. We're part of the restoration movement, and we are uh, big into baptism. We, we think that baptism is essential for salvation. But The thing that I think we forget a lot of times is that if we're a baptized believer and we continue to live a a good life, we we continue to love the Lord, we love our neighbor, and we follow his commands, um, we have salvation. And I think the one thing that we're uh, probably, we don't (laughs) appreciate is we should have confidence in our salvation. I think a lot of times we wonder, are we going to make it to heaven or we ain't? We're going to make it, guys. You, you continue to, to live the good Christian life, you're going to make it in heaven. So what I'm saying here is your eternity has already started, okay? Uh, you are heirs to the kingdom. And so it seems like we'd be a little happier <laughs> than we are a lot of times, you know? And this is good news that, you know, we should be willing to share with everybody. So anyway, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for these young people that are here this evening, and I just pray that you would continue to bless them and uh, uh, help them through their school years. And Father, I pray that they would have uh, new friendships that they'll develop that'll last them a lifetime. And again, we just thank you for this uh, Campus House ministry, and we just pray that you would continue to bless it. Father, we do thank you for your word, and we thank you for the instruction that it gives us. And Father, we do know that we need to keep our faith strong. There's going to be people that are trying to shatter our faith as we go through life. But we, we do know that uh, whenever trials come our way, that you're there with us. Uh, you're walking side by side with us. So, Father, we pray that our faith would remain strong and we would continue to be a strong witness for you. We pray this all in Jesus.